Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexandra Neeson. I am Senior Partnerships Manager here at Plug and Play, and I work for uh, two verticals, new materials and packaging as well as sustainability. Thank you for joining us today. Today um, is our sixth part of uh, our series with Moeco. Um, so this one will kind of wrap it up for the year, um, and then we'll start again in 2021. So if you've been with us since the beginning of the series, thank you for joining us. If you haven't, um, we will be sending a recap of all the um, webinars that we've put on over the past six, six weeks. Um, so today we'll be covering 5G Edge and the future of connectivity. Um, but I'm just going to take some time in the beginning here to go over plug and play a little bit. So uh, Plug and Play is, of course, the ultimate innovation platform. If you haven't heard of us before, um, we'll, I'll go into some, some details now. I'll go to the next slide. So this is kind of what our innovation platform covers. Um, it's broken up into three parts. So we have our accelerator program where we run six, over 60 programs a year across 38 global locations. Um, we're focused in 19 different industry specific verticals um, like new materials and packaging and sustainability. We also have a corporate innovation arm which is very much a part of that program. So during that program, we're not only accelerating startups but we're working with corporates to connect them with those startups and technologies so that they can advance. Um, and then uh, lastly, we also have our venture capital arm where we invest in over 200 companies uh, a year and we also co-invest with some VCs and investors. So this is um, sort of our ecosystem breakdown. So I've mentioned corporates and startups, but we also work with governments, universities, um, VCs and investors, and our mentor network is, is extensive and um, really implemental into to how we run our program and accelerate these startups. So this is just a little bit of a further breakdown of, of our all-in-one solution at Plug and Play. So um, you could see it's broken out by colors for um, different sectors, but um, we offer corporate innovation, uh, which would fall under deal flow sessions. We make direct, direct investments and, and co-invest. Um, and then we offer a bunch of different um, services to our startups um, from our accelerator program that's mainly focused in business development, um, giving them global market access. And we also offer some um, IT solutions and office space. This is a map of our, lo of our location. So uh, Plug and Play is always growing. Um, we were in F38 when I just started. Um, you know, over two years ago. And just to see us grow uh, this much has been really exciting. So you can see our headquarters here is in Silicon Valley. And then we expand across the map all the way into Asia where we have a pretty big pre presence as well. And then lastly, this is just how to engage. So if you would like to uh, work with plug and play, um, here are some different ways that you can do so. So from our programs to our events, um, to our services for our, our corporates, and then just, you know, engaging in our extensive network. And um, if anybody, if you go to the next slide, uh, just my contact. So if anybody has more questions about a potential partnership at Plug and Play or you're a startup looking to get involved in our accelerator program, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is simple, just alexandra at plug and play .com. Um, And yeah, happy to get you connected and follow up with this webinar. So with that, um, I just wanna thank you all for attending. I'll pass it off to Kyle, who's going to introduce our panel today. Um, really excited to have Jim here from 5G Open Innovation Lab to really kind of dive a little deeper into um, what 5G Edge and the future of connectivity is. So thank you, Kyle. Wonderful, Allie, thank you so very much. And also again, thank you to our entire audience as well for tuning in. As Allie mentioned, um, we, we've actually done uh, five additional webinars. Today is the sixth in a series that we've put together in partnership with Plug and Play. And we couldn't have been happier to do this uh, together. Plug and Play has been outstanding partners to us here at Moeco. Uh, we've had the chance to not only go through the program uh, that Allie mentioned she's a part of, of new materials and packaging, but also getting a chance to work with the entire Plug and Play ecosystem and all of its partners along with uh, startups and investors as well. So a big thank you to the entire Plug and Play organization. And also a big thank you to Allie and Tiffany for making this possible and working with us here at Moeco. 
uh, to make this all possible. And again, of those webinars, we kicked things off in the very beginning talking about the fourth industrial revolution, this new information age that we're moving into and why it's so important and how technology and industries are converging faster and faster year over year and what that all means. And so during this series, we've broken things down from an overview of the fourth industrial revolution to the internet of things, ver variety of strategies to trends, also its impact on logistics, to then speaking about automation and how that will play a role in the future supply chains, including the dynamic value networks that we spoke about, and also looking at how enterprise infrastructures are becoming more digital and what that means to digitize your infrastructure as an enterprise as well. Last week, we spoke about the distributed and decentralized applications, that next wave of applications that we are all building for on all sides, whether it's enterprise or it's consumers. Leading us up to today and the final webinar in this first part of the series, which is talking about the future of connectivity, looking at uh, how things are moving from 4G to 5G and beyond, looking at edge and the future of cloud and what this all means to you and your business as well. And so together, we've, we've brought together our founder and CEO, Mitt, who will provide an introduction here in just a moment. And we also brought Jim, the founder of the 5G Open Innovation Lab, one of our partners, to share more with you what is happening. And we're going to have a, a quick uh, conversation and talk a little bit about this between the three of us. And before we get started with introductions, I want to let you know, our audience, that at any moment, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A box here uh, for those. Please drop those in. We'll do our best to ask, ask them in real time if they're relevant to the conversation. If not, we'll save them to the end where we'll have plenty of time for all of your questions that you may have. And if we don't have enough time to get to all of them, we'll have our contact information at the end for you to follow up with each of us uh, as well. And uh, you know, before we get started here, I also want to throw out why this is so important. It's not just a, a buzzword being 5G, but also how economically impactful this is. I wanted to throw a stat out for everybody. Qualcomm did a study uh, recently and actually projected uh, that 5G would bring 22 million new jobs globally and also see an economic impact over, over $12 trillion uh, dollars by 2020, uh, 2035. So if we look at that as where we are today, in the next 15 years, we should see an economic impact of over $12 trillion, huge amount of change as to what this technology will bring, and not just to us as individuals again, but how that will play a role in terms of our enterprises and our technology infrastructures. With that, let's go ahead and get started to introduce each and every one of our panelists. Uh, Jim, welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here as a partner of Moeco. If you can, a little introduction and background on yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kyle, Mitt, and the Plug and Play team. So my name is Jim Brismitzis. I'm the founder and CEO of the 5G Open Innovation Lab, where we see a great opportunity for software developers and startups to really take advantage of some emerging opportunities, both in the public area and the private uh, 5G world as well. And we'll dig into a little bit of that. Uh, prior to finding the lab, I was uh, a 14 year, almost 14 year veteran at Microsoft. I launched the Microsoft for Startups program, ran that with my team for almost four years. Before that, I helped launch Microsoft Ventures. Uh, before that, I had several other uh, roles at Microsoft over that career. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. And, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Mitt, uh, I want to turn over to you real quick, a short little intro and background in yourself, and then also uh, a quick intro on, uh, on Moeco. Yeah, nice meeting you, all of you. And uh, I'm Mitt, uh, CEO and founder of Moeco. More than 10 years designing the IoT and uh, hardware, at the same time, spend a lot of efforts in machine learning, and, uh, and different IT systems. And as, um, as for Moeco, we help companies to digitize their physical assets and inventory with a uh, primary focus on logistics. So we help companies to see what's going on with their shipments in real time. And uh, we do this uh, kind of, I can say, on a unique manner, 
allowing companies to do this on a on a package level. So we're not talking about containers. We're talking about some small packages being digitized. Wonderful. And guys, welcome uh, both of you. Really excited to dive in. I've had the chance to speak both with both of you offline about today's topic. And again, that's the future of connectivity and more specifically around 5G. Um, and, and our first question, as I kind of kick things off with, 5G has become arguably one of the biggest buzzwords over the past few years. Um, however, uh, not everyone really knows what 5G is uh, or how it's defined or what its impact is or why it's important. Uh, so really just starting with the basics and Jim, let's start with you. What is 5G and why is this so important and how is it different um, from the idea of connectivity before, whether that's 3 or 4G or 4G LTE? Yeah, great question. So 5G is the fifth generation of 3GPP's wireless standards. Pre preceding that, obviously, is 4G LT, which we have today, and then before that, 3G and 2G. And what 5G does differently than what 4G LTE has done, which was really baked on top of 3G's platform, is 5G is, in my opinion, a wholesale, um, I would say, a wholesale lift of the networks, uh, because a lot of how the networks are being orchestrated behind the scenes are going cloud. Uh, so for enabling new network functions like um, network slicing, DSS, carrier irrigation, all that fun stuff, that's all software defined um, efforts that are gonna be happening far out in the, in the far edge. And then that's connecting into what essentially is becoming a cloud native network in its own right. So if you read through the 3G PP specifications, that's pretty huge. 5G is also being seen as an opportunity in the enterprise. And that's what we're focused on here at the 5G Open Innovation Lab is really enterprise startups like Moeco, who are really exploring the new capabilities that come with enhanced wireless connectivity in a 5G world, but also the opportunity to pursue that in the context of an enterprise private 5G network. And in that context, it's bigger than just connectivity. Think of a site, um, let's say a big oil refinery or manufacturing site, mining, uh, retail, healthcare. These are sites that are contained infrastructure, contained locations with wireless connectivity, but also the ability to actually contain its compute as well. And that's pretty exciting as a software developer to ultimately get closer to where your users are and have on-demand compute. And so that's the areas that we're exploring here via the lab. So Jim, I want to I want to unpack all of that uh, sure. in just a moment. But it, going back real quick, so now that we know that five G is this next this fifth generation for both you and Mitt, I mean, why is this different, or how is this different than three and four G? Other than it's just the next generation. I mean, five G again is literally the biggest buzzword anyone is talking about in enterprise when it looks toward when they look towards the infrastructure. Uh, or technology stacks they have, which means it's huge for some reason. But why is it so different? And maybe Mitt, you want to kick us off with this one is when we look at 3G and 4G and what those connectivity pieces brought to us and the new applications, how is 5G going to redefine that? Um, there is nothing like nothing new. So effectively everything you can do in 5G, you can also do on a small scale in 4G. I'll give you like an example um connected cameras just like a simple super simple boring example um so you can connect a few cameras and put it like on a 4g network streaming streaming all the stream real time over the mobile network is it possible yes but can you do this on a scale connecting i, I don't know 50,000 cameras in uh, manhattan no because the network like will be down very quickly. And um, the same goes with the quantities. Can we connect uh, half a million of packages through the 4G? Yes. Can we connect uh, 50 million packages uh, going through the United States uh, any day? No, because network will not handle this properly. So like 5G effectively is 4G on the steroids allowing you to to do the same scenarios you do on a 4G, the same scenarios you do on a private Wi-Fi. And we'll talk also about that uh, on a scale. And uh, no magic, more frequencies, more speed. And uh, effectively, everything we tested out in a 4G, we can do on a scale in a 5G, which is makes sense because um, for IoT, 
we're already there that there are more connected devices than people. And it will be more by periods because this is really like a part of our today reality. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at some, based on some of the statistics I've read, we're, we're looking at, you know, 20 plus billion devices in the next few years that will be connected sensors that we'll have access to on our network. And you both are bringing up the key word and that's scale uh, is, is what it sounds like that 5G brings scalability uh, to everything we do uh, in a way that 4G today hasn't been able to. And um, taking a step back, Jim, to a, a lot of what you mentioned uh, is where's the biggest opportunity, right? If scalability comes into play, where is that opportunity for 5G to be impactful? Is it on the enterprise or is it on the consumer side? And it sounded like you mentioned enterprise, but we'd love to hear more uh, of your thoughts as to why and if that's, uh, if that's the case. Yeah, so <clears throat> I... I do think these experiences will get better, you know, maybe, maybe more augmented reality like experience to come as, as the pipes to the phones um, improve. But I really do see, and there's research there that would back this up as well, that this is really a, an enterprise play in the 5G world. If you look at ABI's research that came out this summer, uh, by 2036, they're forecasting that enterprise demand for spectrum globally will supersede consumer. That's a pretty big deal. If you look at the last PAL auction here that the FCC did in the United States, that's the priority access, loss, access um, uh, license auction that happened for uh, CBRS Spectrum. That was a $4 billion take. 170 million of that went to private enterprises like John Deere and utilities around the country. So in the enterprise world, there's a real conversation that's playing out today around the merits of Wi-Fi 6 and LTE or in future 5G coverage of these networks. But ultimately, and Mitt touched upon this, there's a number of new devices that are connecting to it. And for some of the new digitally transforming capabilities that enterprises are going to rely on, whether it's XR scenarios, robotics, autonomous anything, real-time data processing and inferencing and, and proactive um, business management. A lot of that's going to require very fast pipes. Um, a lot of it's going to require local computing. We're already seeing the big hyperscalers, including one of our partners, Microsoft, really make a, a push into that area with its like, acquisition of MetaSwitch and Affirmed recently, and the launch of its Azure Edge Zone as just one example of how the edge is really important. So when I look at 5G, if you stop short at just the connectivity, you're actually missing out on a much, much bigger opportunity because as Mitt pointed out and Kyle, you pointed out earlier as well, this is really the precipitous, in my opinion, of where the four, the industry 4.0 transformation is gonna happen. You need to have better connectivity, which is happening. You need to have localized compute, which is in motion. And from what we're standing on is, you know, developer ecosystem to actually make sense of all that and create new applications that pulls through the value of those platforms. And so for the enterprise, I think it's a pretty big deal um, and, the, you know, the research and all the market insights that we've seen continue to point to that being one of the biggest opportunities. And, and frankly, for the carriers around the world, this is a really good opportunity for them themselves to transform. They've got a strong consumer base. And in many cases, a lot of carriers around the world today also have a pretty healthy enterprise base. Well, in my opinion, the 5G opportunity, whether it's in, the, in their public WAN area or even in the private 5G world, I think that's a huge opportunity for them to step in and create more value. And really what they need is an ecosystem to do that, which is no different where the hyperscalers are. And so that's, you know, that's what we again focus on here in the lab. So, so let's talk about those, those, that ecosystem and those opportunities for developers. Um, you know, where, where do those areas of opportunity exist and what does that ecosystem look like for 5G, um, whether it's on the carrier side or it's on the enterprise side um, as well from your viewpoint. And then I, I wanna get to some use cases and diving a little deeper on that, but let's talk about that ecosystem for developers. Yeah, there's several areas that we're really seeing um, you know, early signs of momentum. One is, is in XR experiences. And so in the past where virtual reality, augmented reality or mixed reality was sort of like a great science project and kind of nice tech, but how do you use it? We're seeing a lot more adoption of that in the enterprise. And to my point earlier, connectivity is playing a big role in that. The second area that I see a lot of traction in, this is well-documented, is in automation. So a lot of companies are now automating a lot more of their, 
their, their processes or business processes. And that's depending on robotics and IoT uh, based data and others. And so that's taken a much bigger swing. And in fact, our, our partner Avanad spoke about that at length last week when we had them meet with our teams and, and Mitt was part of that conversation where COVID has really accelerated a lot of their investments into automating a lot of their businesses. Another area that we're seeing is in that private 5G space, which we've talked about, and we'll probably talk more about that as well. Um, and then the last piece, uh, which sort of continues to evolve from even our hyperscaler cloud days is in security. When you go from, let's say, 9 billion connected devices today to over 25 to 26 billion devices is forecasted from the GSMA. Well, all you're doing now is opening up a much broader threat, uh, threat vector. And for a cybersecurity hack, that's a great opportunity to find holes in systems to, to penetrate and, and eventually do some nefarious activities. And so security is going to be a much, much bigger play initially on the IoT side, but as more and more applications are exposed to farther parts of the edge, and even in private uh, instances of 5G as well, I think security is going to be a big opportunity. The rest is kind of what the early days of the internet was. We had this internet, and we had a few folks set up some marketplaces, and then we now know what's happened since. So there's a lot of innovation still to be uncovered in that area. Well, and you, as you turn on all of these sensors uh, and all these devices, just as consumers as well, I mean, those security threats open up left and right, Huge. Um, not just on the IoT side and the enterprise, but again, you know, if we have some type of connected device on us in more so, right? Right now, I think the average person has anywhere from three to five connected devices on them at any given time, you know, turn that into double, uh, look at their home and how many connected devices they have in their home to then into their office space, et cetera. I mean, this grows dramatically. And I think you're calling out one of the more important or if not potentially one of the most important use cases on the developer ecosystems that need to be paid attention to. Yeah. Um, in the future of this. And Mitt, I, I want to come to you. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Uh, Mitt, I, I want to come to you as well and, and hear from you. What are you seeing as some of the key use cases uh, or applications around uh, 5G, right? If we increase bandwidth, we increase scalability, we now have higher throughput and volume. Where are some of those use cases where this can be applied? Yeah, sure. So the, the use cases could be like in many areas, there are tons of them. I'll give you like the one, uh, literally the, the simplest one, just like to enable imagination and we'll go forward. Um, I, won't, I was involved with the computer vision pro project uh, where uh, people have a cameras at home and uh, cameras recognize their actions. For example, the elderly people. Mm -hmm. And uh, if some accidents happen, so the computer vision system makes an alarm. So in a current like in a current circumstances, the only one way to make this project happen, uh, even with a cable network, is to put like a big computer at home, which will make all this kind of computer vision calculations. Because otherwise, having your your cable is not good enough to handle upstream of five to six cameras at the same time. So even like the cable communication is limited. We're not talking about like the wireless one. 5G makes these things way easier with a millimeter wave like and uh, upgraded infrastructure. Some of those use cases, typically you can implement them way easier, just like sticking the camera with no computer and having the service saying, oh, I have a camera in, like at, at this room. So if something happened with the elderly people in this room, I'll get an alarm with no complicated setup, with no computer being installed under your grand grandma bed or something like that. Uh, it's just like one of the examples. And uh, literally in a business, uh, business is all about that. It's business is all about automation, recogn like recognizing people actions in a warehouse, preventing dangerous situation by automatically analyzing tons of data. And currently you have to deal with a, with a on-premise uh, installations of very complex systems. And uh, just imagine uh, a Starbucks. Starbucks wants to implement the same system recognizing, for example, someone steals something from, from your pocket while you're in Starbucks. So, Today, they have to install uh, a noisy server in each Starbucks to make this computer vision work. 
because they cannot upstream all the videos. With a 5G and millimeter wave, they can do this in a cloud. And effectively, if some of the Starbucks are like closed, they don't have to run the computer or consume their energy. And uh, for the like Starbucks, it will be very cost-saving operation, and they can deploy the same system in a day instead of a month. Mm -hmm. It's like computer vision is one one topic, but we have tons of other applications. And Jim mentioned that uh, why enterprise, for example, should take care of five G now. Um, because from one perspective, you're just like a consumer. You just need you to get your small internet packets sent and received. But from another one, enterprise, especially industrial assets, they, they being, they're typically being planned for years in advance. So and when companies now planning, oh, let's have a Wi-Fi, like proper Wi-Fi setup. Why you should do Wi-Fi? Because I believe in a... In a in 10 years perspective, like there'll be no Wi-Fi and enterprise, there'll be only like private 5G and, uh, and that's it. Because the magic is, this is all about money. Uh, I'll just like finish it like in a sec. Uh, operators, they paid uh, billions for licenses of Spectrum. So they push scientists and developers to make 4G and 5G super efficient in terms of how many bytes per one megahertz you can actually transmit. And even LTE nowadays is, how to say, is way more efficient than Wi-Fi. So using the same amount of spectrum, LTE, you can put more data than on a Wi-Fi. 5G brings it even further. So when you're planning your next factory, your next uh, industrial location, 5G is the most efficient choice in terms of how much data you can transmit. And I was on a well site of some oil company in Texas, and they they all crying because they cannot transmit the data with a Wi-Fi because on a small location, Wi-Fi is overloaded already for oil company. We're talking about not even a IT company, we're talking about oil company having a, limitations because of the Wi-Fi is not working. So if you if you don't mind, Kyle, I'd like to add to what Mitt said. Mitt and the Moeco team, and this is a you know a very important plug for them, they they've done a fantastic job of creating the IoT platform of collecting data. But as we heard from our colleagues at Avana that work you know with enterprises around the world, IoT has been a reactive experience and what people are shifting to is a proactive experience. And Mitt's touched upon some of that and some of the promises we see in Moeco going forward is that when you have the ability to connect these devices that are reporting information, critical information, and you have localized compute that can actually make sense of that in the machine learning world and then take proactive um, actions, that moves enterprises forward. And that's the big opportunity. I think IoT has been a great industry and it's uh, certainly built some momentum, but I think now in this 5G world, uh, as more and more of those networks become deployed and the cost of those networks starts to really drop, um, you're gonna see it more enterprises depend on IoT from SCADA systems and large industrial units to little sensors you know, that track packages and temperature and everything else being very important inputs of information that help companies be more proactive with that data. And that's what's really exciting. There's a raging debate between the future of 5G and Wi-Fi 6 and MIT certainly in the middle of that. But what I can say is that in the past, cellular networks were really expensive networks to plan and deploy. We're actually in the process of doing one of our own here in the Seattle area. Um, but the cost of that is coming down quite a bit. And for those of um, the, the listeners today that are from enterprises, there's some great companies that are really pursuing that opportunity. Uh, Freedom Fi is in our batch um, that's taking Project Magma from Facebook and deploying that through CBRS Spectrum at scale. Uh, there's a partner of ours called Solona that's just raised an additional 20 or $30 million, I believe, of funding that is also doing that at scale. So the cost and the complexity of, of building these networks is dropping. And that you know, that's a supportive point to Mitt's earlier comments around Wi-Fi versus uh, um, uh, 5G deployments in the future. Sorry to interrupt, but there was a good point there I wanted to add on top. No, it's perfect. I mean, it, look, the Internet of Things has, has delivered a promise 
uh, of what we could see in the future for the past 10 years. There's right. continually been a talk of it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I think you bring it, bring it to, to point very well is, you know, we've seen this being built and developed. Now it's actually time to, to start uh, connecting those dots the way the internet of things or IOT was meant to, or always dreamt uh, to be and 5G could be, or will be hopefully that, uh, that missing glue uh, that we had for the decade previous as we look to the next 10 years ahead of us uh, as well. And that actually brings me to, to a great question. Um, I was reading one of your articles recently um, that you had published on your blog, Jim, about this uh, three-legged stool uh, model that you have about the future uh, of enterprise uh, infrastructures around 5G, the edge, and uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Would you be able to share a little bit more about what that looks like and what that means and why that's important to enterprises out there today? Yeah, so the, the model, the three-legged stool model is something borrowed from my time at, at Microsoft. We would also, we'd often look at big market forces and what we had found, at least in you know the circle of conversations that I had with my colleagues at Microsoft was, it was not typically one force that made an impact in the market broadly. It was usually a combination of, and it's typically three. So I'll take you back uh, very quickly to the 3G to 4G transition. There was really three things that played out in that era to, to afford us what we have and enjoy today. The first was um, the networks were moving from 3G to 4G and that transition essentially brought more data capacity. So we went from kilobytes of data capacity to megabytes, which means the, the phones could accomplish so much more, but the phones had not caught up until Steve Jobs walked on stage one day to introduce the iPhone for the first time in 2007. So that combination of bigger data pipe and a smartphone device that actually can run applications then led way to a, a thriving developer community where we saw at Microsoft a big rush in the mobile world. So where we enjoyed a pretty significant developer ecosystem on the PC, there was a move from those developers and new developers coming into the market that were creating apps for mobile. Those three forces independently wouldn't have had the big impact we see today with smartphones and the app ecosystem. Those forces brought together is really what uh, we think made you know the, the, the impact of 4G and new apps and all of the economy around those apps possible, of course, with a smartphone being the vehicle to do that as the application platform. In a 5G world, we look at three other vectors. We looked at the transition from 4G to 5G being fundamentally different as Mitt and I chatted about earlier. Secondly, uh, at my time at Microsoft, I saw more and more developers wanting to push their applications closer to the edge. At Microsoft, we called it the intelligent edge, but they're wanting to get far closer to where their users were because their workloads or use cases demanded it. Certainly if you were an autonomous vehicle startup or you had some experiences that really needed localized compute, you wanted to be closer to where, you know, where the edge was. Um, and then thirdly, there's a big market momentum that's happening in, in, in terms of industry 4.0 or the industrial revolution, the compute revolution, whatever you want to call it. There's significant amount of effort and funding that's going into that. In fact, IDC reported earlier this year as well, $2.3 trillion is being spent by enterprises to digitally transform their businesses, to move from, let's say, analog business processes to become more digital, to move from reactive data collection on IoT to more predictive action-oriented um, activities. And so when you bring those three forces together, again, you're, you're setting up for a pretty big, uh, significant move. And um, I can go on for days about where that impact is happening, but that's the essence of it. So developers independently, without a platform to build on, aren't aren't so valuable. They can't create value on those platforms. They certainly can't reach a broader market. Uh, 5G with just 5G signaling and connectivity is valuable as we've talked about earlier, but there's so much more you can do by actually embedding applications in the networks themselves. Um, and then the big force that's gonna drive and pull through all that through is this transformation journey that, that enterprises are on today. So when you take a, a macro view of the market and look at those individual forces, it's setting up for a pretty big opportunity and what was lacking in the 5G world was, was a developer ecosystem. And, and that's, again, that's what we're all here to actually go and create an exercise. Yeah, and, and one other thing that, on that note that you brought up and admit you've brought up as well, and I admit this one's for you, is private 5G. Um, we've now got this developer ecosystem that's being built. We're now looking at how the, we can deploy more sensors, connect more things. 5G, we're starting to understand, but what is private 5G? 
Uh, you both have mentioned it to our audience. What is it and how does this also differ from what we know as Wi-Fi to uh, LoRa or even BTLE or Bluetooth uh, low energy um, for those that are listening? So Mitt, for, for you. Yeah, sure. And I also try to answer the questions from the Q&A. We already have one. Yeah, so uh, just real quick. I'll, so sorry, Mitt. Uh, Q&A, we've got one or two more questions for the panel and then I'll come to Q&A afterwards. So sure. uh, okay, no, no worries. But like, um, I'll try to, I always try to explain as I explaining to my grandma. <laughs> sorry for simplicity. <laughs> uh, yeah, so private 5G is effectively the, the Wi-Fi on steroids. So it's... Uh, uh, enterprise level private network you can deploy on 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 a ground um, achieving um, interoperability of the devices so the same devices can work in your network and when you move them away they'll switch to the public uh, 5g networks like t-mobile at and in verizon and uh, there are tons of applications um i'll give i'll give you like some of them um simplest one um uh, Tracking trucks on uh, industrial facilities with a five seconds interval. So LoRa is not capable of uh, handling more than uh, five to six hundred trucks at the same time on a limited space. Uh, Wi-Fi, it, it's not super reliable in terms of the distance. And just imagine this is not a building. This is kind of industrial area. Um, Bluetooth neither. So using uh, asking some like some operator to install a special base station for you could also not work because it could be in the middle of nowhere and operator will say no, I'm not interested. So literally there are not not that many options to uh, to make this happen. And uh, people are playing with the private mobile networks already for a while. I was doing like as a more like a hackathon, my private GSM network, like back in like 10 years ago. But with a LTE and 5G, this is already goals to the, to the level where like tons of companies offering the same solutions as Nokia does for millions of US dollars, but currently they have a all-in-one package, effectively looking like as your desktop PC, and you can run your own network. Uh, your own mobile network. So your iPhone will say, oh, it's a, it's a Kyle network in the middle of Canada. And uh, before that, you have to pay millions. Currently, it's already tens of thousands of US dollars. And it's definitely super affordable for enterprise and it will become cheaper and cheaper. I assume that in uh, five to 10 years, the, the price of making your own network will be around five to 10K US dollar. And, uh, we already spoke about spectral efficiency, so you can put like more data, even you can put on a Wi-Fi, and the distances are way beyond the uh, than you can do with a Wi-Fi. So, uh, 5G is effectively your private network. You can do without asking uh, big data uh, from T-Mobile or AT&T or Verizon, and uh, it's also cost-efficient because once it's your private network, you don't pay the subscription fee, and at the same time, you have a super flexible setup. As any of your trucks move to the outside world, they'll be connected to the public network and continue to send you data. So this is like super simple concept. So uh, one one big question for both of you, and then uh, we've got some outstanding questions, Mitt, as you pointed out, and uh, keep them coming in, audience, as, as we will have here in just a moment. We'll switch over to that. but. Uh, uh, Jim, for you, and then uh, uh, Mitt uh, to follow. Uh, what advice do you have for those looking to either begin integrating and or expanding the use of 5G, whether that's public or private, uh, within their organization uh, as executives? We know that it's always good to have these conversations in the boardroom or in the meeting room, but uh, in terms of actually going through in the in implementation integration of this, what advice do you have for those looking to get started? So Jim, let's start with you and then Mitt, we'll, we'll come to you. Yeah, great question. Um, I've actually answered this quite a bit and it really depends on the, uh, you know, sort of the IT plan or path of the organization itself. Some, some organizations I've spoken to, spoken to tend to lean in a little bit more 
and get on that bleeding edge of, of adoption. Others are, are taking a more cautious approach. Wh whatever, whatever the approach is, my, my basic recommendation is, is start a small trial. As Mitt mentioned, you can set up a CBRS-based 5G small cell network here in the United States for less than 20,000 and that price will continue to drop down. So even just setting up a small network, running some IoT use cases, if, you, if you're into robotics or using that, having those use cases in that trial will help you get more familiar with the network and what's possible. And then from there, you can decide what's the right way to evolve that pilot into something a little bit more full-fledged. We're seeing everything from early stage pilots, like what is this and does this simply just replace my Wi-Fi network uh, to auto manufacturers that are actually depending on campus-wide private 5G networks around the world. I mean, in, the, in, in Germany, just this, um, just this year, I think it was Mercedes, BMW, Thyssen, Krupp, uh, Volkswagen, they all bought Spectrum from the German regulators. And in the case of BMW, they're using that to cover their entire manufacturing facilities with coverage. So at the very least, to get into a five, you're building your own private 5G network, even just a small one, um, is relatively inexpensive, but it's a great opportunity to test and learn. And then from that, you're, you're, um, as you're, you're learning from those use cases, you can decide what's the right path to eventually evolve and grow that. But it's a great, it's a great opportunity to learn. If not learning, I would be concerned because I think uh, where 5G is going generally is going to be a key part of transformation journeys in that digital 4.0 uh, revolution that, that will be critical. So yeah. I, would, I would suggest just starting with a small pilot. Mitt, to you, anything else to add? Thank you, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I actually personally dislike the word strategy a lot because it's almost about uh, just like showing off, but uh, this is exactly the, the moment I want to say this because if you have a company uh, doing something like manufacturing, uh, reselling, retailer or anything around this, so you just need to imagine the nearest future in five years, how many connected devices, how many cameras you'll have on the ground. And then uh, it's not about 5G, it's about solving your business needs, uh, moving from um, spending a lot of human efforts to digitize the assets. Is this table clean in the cafe or not? Why people should check it? Because it's, it, it will be fully automated. To fully automate it, you need to, to have a data source, either a sensor or a camera, and you have to take this bandwidth into the account. And then you should ask people who know the topic, what is the best solution that I'll not switch the technologies next 10 years? Because all things, we like to change iPhones every year. Uh, when I deploy sensors on the ground for oil and gas, for logistics companies, those sensors have a lifetime up to 15 years. So uh, I can say this is like a lot and companies don't like to change the technologies uh, that often. Once you plan it, you're, you're done for next 15 years and this is like the way it should be done. So. This is like why we're talking about 5G, because 5G has definitely a very long life cycle. As we currently have a end of life cycle of the initial 2G networks. So T-Mobile ends their 2G network uh, this year in the United States. So it was like almost uh, 30 years. So the 5G has a, will have a, almost the similar lifespan. So you pretty much sure everything you invest in there will stay with you. Yeah, and just to add to that point, 4G, and Mitt, keep me honest on this, but 4G has been in market for, what, 10 to 12 years? 12 years, yes. Yeah, and we're, we're just matured at 4G. It's a very matured um, platform. We understand it very well. 5G is no different. It'll be another 10 to 12 years before we get to that maturity. So the good news is we're early in this journey of this standard. Which means we're all going through it at the same time, which is a Pretty great much. learning opportunity uh, to both of your points. And Yeah. Um, you know, first and foremost, Jim, Mitt, thank you so much for, for all of the insights and all the time for, for questions uh, as well today. So really appreciate it. But we do have some great questions. I want to rapid fire them over to you. Uh, Jim, this one I think is for you uh, from Jonathan. And, and it was uh, following up on your mention around uh, Germany and buying up Spectrum. Yeah. So, so 
that's a good that's a good question, Jonathan. I want to take that one head on. So if if you go to the FCC website, they've actually published everyone who bought Spectrum and CBRS. Um, I would argue, unless this becomes a defined IT part of your plan, it, it becomes part of your plan. The easiest and fastest way, to my earlier point, was to buy your own 5G system and go through uh, an SAS provider like a Google or a Sony or a Federated Wireless and just get some local CBRS access. You don't have to bid on your own PAL license. You can simply just acquire that as part of your, your own testing and familiarity with the networks. If at that point it becomes something that the company realizes is really important and 5G becomes, or future 5G private networks become part of your IT plan, then you can start to decide and evaluate the value of bidding for your own spectrum. So the, the list of auction buys that the FCC has publicly disclosed from last July are all companies, uh, whether they're small telecommunications companies, regional ones, or private enterprises like John Deere and Chevron and others, they've all committed to that destiny, to that journey. And so they're actually buying their own spectrum that they would have full use of in that one geography, in that one zip code. So before we even go there, if, if you're just dabbing your toe into the 5G private network world, simply acquiring your own um, local network and deploying that and then buying spectrum access or an SAS provider is the easiest thing to do to get going. And then as you learn and evolve and grow from that, you can decide what the right path forward is to go down the path of buying your own, um, your own spectrum. I, I, I haven't spoken to the folks at Chevron or John Deere, but I would venture to say that they had probably already gone through those trials and had made some informed decisions around committing to actually buying their own spectrum through those auctions before they went down, down that path. So Jim and Mitt, this one's a little technical, and then we've got one really big question I think that will, will kind of take us to time. But uh, uh, from Thomas, any thoughts or impacts around uh, MM waves that Apple is engineering for uh, the iPhone platform? Again, uh, a technical question, so maybe... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not only Apple. I mean, it's, uh, it's not Apple proprietary technology. It's just like one more very high frequency, about tens of gigahertz. So, which means it works in a direct line of sight, but on a very high speed. So, uh, and it's currently primarily being used only in the United States, uh, while not that much adopted uh, in Europe uh, for like different reasons we'll not discuss, but like effectively it's uh, one more frequency added to the, uh, to the 5G standard, uh, super limited in distance, but super high speed. So could be useful, especially for anything uh, I already mentioned regarding the computer vision systems, distributed and computer vision systems also answering to the question of Mara, not only for a stationary object, but also for the movable one. Uh, Nothing, not, nothing really super special, just like one more frequency to the standard. Got it. So, so this is a good question from Mara, and uh, we didn't get a chance to dive a lot into this during the panel, but wanted to bring it up to you. Is she asked if we can talk a little bit more about mobile five G use cases beyond oil and gas and manufacturing? And to her point, those two, and then the industrial Internet of Things, so IIoT are commonly talked about when it comes to 5G. But uh, let's go beyond that. What other mobile use cases are you seeing around 5G, whether that be gaming, whether that be autonomous vehicles, whether that's uh, our digital lives and what we're looking to live here in the future? Uh, Jim, if you could kind of kick us off, are there other use cases you could share with us uh, outside of those industrial use cases that are commonly spoken about? Yeah, we, um, we actually looked at some data on that. Um... So let me, uh, let me speak to some of the ones that we know are popping immediately. The first is um, transportation, and that's inclusive of both automotive and I would throw into that the whole supply chain uh, market area. The second big area is uh, retail. So retail is, is expected to be using a lot more IoT-based solutions as one of several use cases, um, but we're seeing some early interest in that. Whole hospital systems are moving to, so entire hospital buildings where you literally have thousands of devices from EKG machines to CAT machines to a number of other devices that are transmitting data in a secure way 
um, hospital buildings are looking at deployments of 5G networks. And so I think that's a big one. Uh, one of our proof of concept customers that we're in, in conversations with is a utility in Oregon, and they're looking at building out their own private 5G network. So utilities are looking at that. Um, they have particular use cases in, in their world that require less than 10 milliseconds response time off IoT data coming from the grid. Anything more than that and a part of their grid could go down. Uh, so utilities is, is, a big, is a big area. Gaming is one that's been touched on. That's more of a consumer play. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's really exciting. And then <clears throat> this was said to me the other day, and, and until I thought about it more you know, deeply, it, it made a lot of sense. But the largest enterprise here in the United States that is actively investing in 5G R&D is the Department of Defense. It's the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen, whether it's the DOD, NASA being a partner of ours here in the lab, the USDA and other agencies, federal agencies are increasingly turning to 5G for a whole host of use cases. Simple things like rural connectivity, farming, which is an area that we're looking at in, in part of our startup, uh, sorry, our test bed plans here in the Seattle area, um, to warfighter programs for the DOD, whether that's in aviation, on the ground, um, terrestrial, orbital, doesn't matter. Uh, so that's another big area that, um, that we see as, as industries. Um, so healthcare, retail, transportation, including cars, logistics. Um, the last one I would touch on is entertainment. Uh, that, that industry will eventually catch up, but as we start to consume content with devices that we're not having our hands on today, I'm thinking augmented reality or virtual reality devices, as that market continues to scale out, the price points drop. Um, I think there's an important inflection there that that whole experience of how we consume content will change. And if it does change, I think that will present a great use case opportunity. There's a question that Jonathan asked, Kyle, if you don't mind, I'd love to tackle that before we move on to the next question. Sure. So sure. we're at the top end of the market for 5G. We're just getting started in this real roller coaster. So we're real, at the- Real quick, Jim, let me, yeah. let me just repeat it for everybody. So oh, sure. everyone else knows, because not everyone can see the questions as oh, we can. Sure. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, Jim, uh, Jonathan's question was, how fast do you see technology depreciating in the 5G world after rollout, does the cost of install maintenance make the ROI, return on investment on upgrades, palatable? Sorry, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, certainly. So as I was saying, we're at the top end of this roller coaster. We're just at the early days of 5G, which means the supply of 5G modems and phones is limited. The supply of 5G radios, fairly still limited. Once we get to much more massive adoption and the industry starts to catch up, then the cost, the unit costs of whether it's the modems, the radios, the equipment, the end user devices, all that starts uh, to drop uh, quite significantly. So we're at the prime right now. We're at the stage where plasma TVs were for the first time. Do you remember those selling for twenty to $40,000? And now you can buy a great um, LED, OA LED screen for less than $500. We're at that phase and it's going to take about a year or two, in my opinion, to actually bring that down to something more, more palatable for the broader market to start driving adoption. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Uh, sure. Matt, back to, back to you real quick on the uh, use cases of mobile 5G. Any additional use cases you're seeing than those that Jim mentioned? Um, um, again, I already mentioned like tons of this. This is like, I, I just like briefly, it's not uh, an advertising, but I think the as cheaper the end devices will be because we all take care about about the data then the more devices will be deployed then the more use cases we will see uh, like in real life and as for movable movable use cases a uh, few came to my mind uh, currently as we don't have a uh, fully autonomous cars there are hybrid technologies where like um, uh, how to say people sitting remotely and like putting uh, their remote control on the buses, trucks. Uh, in San Francisco, as I know, in March, there will be a launch of a car rental, but the car will be driving to the, to the airport for, with, with a remote driver. And you will be jumping in a, in a rental car, but on a ta 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 taxi lane. Uh, this is one of the examples. Drones, uh, drones and delivery. Currently, it's not efficient to put a fully autonomous computing system on a drone to do the computer vision calculation. So you have it's better to stream 
the data to the cloud, make a computation there with a very low latency because it's a flying thing and send the control signals back. And it will make Amazon Live for like delivery way, way easier besides any security applications and all, all around that. So it's uh, tens of different applications, exactly, totally possible in 4G, but uh, 4G has a limited capability to do this on a scale. And that's why we're talking about 5G now. Last last question as we, we come to close here, uh, it's, it's kind of a teaser out there is, we, we have some companies that are already talking about 6G and we're just getting started with 5G. Is 6G something that we should be paying attention to or is it just uh, a, a blip in the air and something to move past? Uh, I can say, I can say, don't think about it. It's, uh, it's more, more about the business. Um, it's more about use cases. And uh, we're already saying that splitting the computational power in the cloud and having a data stream coming from the end device. This is like, what, a, what is the 5G about? Making this on a scale. So don't think about all this Gs. Think about your business, uh, your ROI, optimizing the people efforts, removing uh, things you don't need. So it's all about automation, finally. And um, nothing, nothing really special. Don't think about 6G. Just like make your business runs better. There, there, there you go. So again, thank you everybody so much for tuning in today. And also uh, Jim and Mitt, thank you again so very much for all of your thoughts and insights uh, and taking time with us uh, today and, and sharing more about the future of connectivity uh, as well. And uh, before we go, Mitt, uh, a quick shout out, where can everyone find you and the MoEco uh, team to connect more and uh, continue the conversation? Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Jim, uh, so everyone definitely check out moeco.io uh, to continue that conversation. Mitt's contact information's here and it'll be on the next slide in just a moment. Jim, to you again, thank you. And also where can people find you online uh, to continue the conversation as either directly with you or with the Open Innovation Lab? Sure, we have our, our website at 5goilab.com. Please feel free to take a look at that. We've um, got some great content and a lot of uh, all of our companies actually that we've gone through both batch one and batch two are listed there. Um, I've had a few folks reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thank you for doing that. I'd love to stay in touch and continue this discussion. Um, and then finally, um, just a parting comment for from my standpoint, uh, and MIT is a representation of that and in, in how we view the world uh, of 5G. It, it, is an, it ultimately will become a software world and what it needs is an ecosystem. And that's that's why we're so humbled to have the opportunity to work alongside Mitt and Alexandra from Moeco and all the other teams that we work with and all of our founding partners, we're all here to figure out what that software journey is in a 5G world. So Kyle, thank you for having me and Mitt, thanks for bringing me on, on today. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and again, everyone, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us as well. And again, thank you to Mitt. Uh, and Jim, and a big thank you as well to Alexa, or excuse me, Ali and Tiffany, uh, the entire plug and play organization, plug and play new materials, IoT, and so many others who have helped make this webinar series, not just today, but the five previous possible, all covering the fourth industrial revolution and diving deep into those pieces. Uh, as well. And as we mentioned, this was the end of our first phase of these webinars. We've got more coming here in the early uh, 2021. Do reach out to the plug and play team, including Ali uh, and Tiffany on ideas or subject matters that you would like to see covered or Alexa and myself uh, as well. And then if you have any follow-up questions for the Moeco team, myself, Alexa, Mitt, uh, or would like to get in further contact with Jim, we'd, be love, we'd love to continue that conversation with you, feel free to reach out to us either on LinkedIn. Please do add context as to where you met us and what the follow-up is for. And then also feel free to reach out to us directly via email as well. And again, a big thank you to the Plug and Play organization for making this all possible. I'm Kyle, Jim, Mitt, thank you. Allie, Tiffany, again, thank you. And to your audience, uh, thank you again so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody.